Good afternoon. It is 104 and I'm calling the rules and administration committee to order. Since we are virtual, I'm going to ask Ms. Johnson to take the roll. Chair Dietzik. Here. Vice Chair Rest. Here. Lee Johnson. Present. Senator Champion. Present. Senator Eichhorn. Senator Frentz. Here. Senator Limmer. Here. Senator Marty. Senator Miller. Sorry. Uh, Miller's here. Senator Marty. Here. Senator Murphy. I see Senator Murphy. Yeah. Uh, Senator Eichhorn. Uh, Senator Murphy. Can't hear you. Senator Murphy is acknowledging she's here, but we can't hear her. So, all right. Do we have a quorum? We have a quorum. Awesome, thank you. Um, first item on our agenda is staff compensatory time. So we discussed this earlier this year, we removed the requirement for staff to work five hours not paid before they could earn um, comp time. And we discussed it at that time that we were concerned that some members might reach the max. And um, since we have been working hard, um, a lot this year, maybe not any different than budget years, but been working hard. Um, we've had 14 staffers hit the max um, time of 220 hours. So we had discussed at that time, you know, kind of evaluating along the way to see how many staff reach it and when they reach it and then possibly extending it. So um, for this reason, I'm bringing a resolution to increase the maximum hours that can be earned to 300 hours. And that is for this session only. And we'll continue to discuss it after this session to see what is um, the best time. Um, this is where the house has put theirs at is 300 hours. Um, you know, our staff is doing hard work. We have phenomenal staff. They're putting in um, a lot of effort to make us look good. And so I want to make sure that they are um, rewarded appropriately. So um, I appreciate all their effort and any questions or comments. I have, I have one. Did, were you going to say anything? Uh, Madam Chair, I think uh, Senator Rust had a question. Okay, Senator Rust. Um, th thank you, Madam Chair. I was just uh, curious, um, have we been in this situation before where we had um, uh, a number of staff um, in the last five or six years or whatever uh, reached the maximum? Um, COVID was kind of a different situation, but I believe, okay. yeah, I believe Secretary Bodern and or um, Betty Myers or Nicole Miner are with us, so they might be able to answer that question. Secretary Bodern. Madam Chair and members, I think what I would say is there have been typically a handful of staff who may reach the comp time limits in past years, but the number you just provided, 14 staff at this point in session is that's unusual and would call it extraordinary. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll also point out that some people in the sergeant's office, they start accumulating this uh, in December and with the, um, the move and shifting offices that added time. And then with the move and reorg, reorg in um, nonpartisan Senate council and research and fiscal staff has also accumulated a lot of time. So um, I think they are the bulk of that. So. Any other questions? Um, did I see a hand up? Hold on. Do you want a motion? Um, I have, I was going to ask Senator Champion if he will move the CR005 resolution. So moved. Madam All right. Chair. Senator Champion moves the CR005 resolution. All in favor say aye. 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 
Opposed? And the resolution is adopted. So now we'll move on to, thank you members. So now we're gonna move on to the bills. The first on the agenda is Senate file 73, and this is the cannabis bill. Um, the rules committee has a very small jurisdiction over this bill. So I'm gonna ask Senate council to outline which portions of the bill are in our jurisdiction. Um, so Ms. Stengel, can you walk us through that? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the provisions before the committee are both in Article 6, Section 1, Subdivision 2, starting on 203.26, and in the Section 2 of the same article, starting on 205.28. Both of them are similar subdivisions in that it talks about negotiating compacts, and if the governor uh, designates people to do the negotiating. It has to be two members of the House and two members of the Senate. Uh, one of the sections relate to medical cannabis and the other relates to adult use cannabis. Um, okay, so Senator Port, welcome to the committee and can you please present these sections of the bill? Absolutely, thank you for having me. Um, the parts of Senate File 73 related to this committee's jurisdiction just ensures that the legislature is fulfilling its responsibilities of oversight and implementation of this law when it comes to working with the sovereign tribes within Minnesota on how they make their own decisions regarding cannabis. Senate File 73 allows Minnesota to negotiate with the tribes on adult use cannabis and medical cannabis, and that representatives from the legislature are part of these negotiations by requiring that if the governor appoints designees to negotiate, they must include members from the House and the Senate. We have been thoughtful and methodical on our work on this legislation, and we're being diligent in including all stakeholders as we craft this legislation. There has and will continue to, uh, that has and will continue to include the sovereign nations located within our state borders. Uh, this is not just the governor, um, but also the legislature that are working with the tribes within Minnesota in crafting future agreements uh, on this issue. And I uh, urge your support and I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Senator Port. Members, any questions? I guess I do again, sorry. Senator Rust. Uh, thank you. The, um, uh, the identification of the um, uh, two policy committees um, is not particularly specific, and it just says health committees. And I was just wondering, if, um, was that kind of an agreed upon designation? And now it's understood where that will, uh, will that will be, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Port, who those people Sen will be? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Senator Rest and Madam Chair. Um, because the Senate and the House named their committees differently, um, it was uh, assumed to be that it would be Health and Human Services in the Senate. And I I'm honestly not sure the House uh, name, but it's different than that, um, but that it would be those two chairs. We are open to clarifying that um, if if it becomes necessary, uh, but at this point, it seems to be agreed upon language. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm Senator Rust. I think um, usually Senator um, Port, rather than naming the chair of a committee, we name the chair of the committee with jurisdiction over certain. Um, uh, policies and I think I think that would clear up any um, uh, confusion uh, and I don't know whether you're open to an amendment to to put it in that language but it seems to me that that um, that's what we often do rather than naming a chair of a committee that actually doesn't exist so Senator Russ so it does say standing committees with jurisdiction over health policy. So would it would you change it to um, how how would you change it, or does council have any suggestion on if it were to be changed? Well, um, um, Madam Chair, maybe I'm looking at the wrong language that I thought was coming um, um, before us, but I maybe I'm to... looking at the wrong language. Okay, I'm sorry. That's what I got in it in the email. So I guess I got I got the wrong, I got the wrong um, two sections of the bill. So 
So I'm looking at the ninth engrossment. Yeah. Yeah. Which the numbers are different than what Lexi gave me, but I have like 206.3 on that line. Starting at 206.2, it said two of whom must be chairs of the Senate and House of Representatives standing committees with jurisdiction over health policy. Okay, and th that's what I would have suggested it being changed to, okay. but my my same article, same um, lines uh, said it include the chairs of the Senate and House of Representatives health committees. So what the language you read is certainly superior and I just must have an old copy of the language. I'm online and I clicked on the ninth, the ninth engrossment. Yep, I was looking at the ninth engrossment, article six, section one, sub two. Senator Port, any comments? Senator Dietzik, uh, the language that you have is the most updated version. Okay. All right, Senator Rest, does that work? Sure. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? Sorry, we're on two pages here. I got to scroll to see if anybody else. Um, all right, no other questions. Senator Marty, will you move that Senate file 73 be recommended to pass and refer to the tax committee? So moved. All right, Senator Marty moves that Senate file 73 be recommended to pass and refer to the tax committee. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The bill is recommended to pass and referred to the tax committee. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next on the agenda is Senate File 63. Um, this is relating to gender affirming health care. Senator Abler made a motion to refer to the referral under Senate Rule 21. So Senator Abler, welcome back to the Rules Committee and please share why you believe this bill needs to be re-referred to another committee. Yeah, exactly. And I've just got a few short comments here. As you, um, this has to do with uh, gender affirming care, and my particular concern relates to Section Three, uh, but also a, a comment in general. Uh, the impact of Section Three, uh, I believe, will affect both in-state and out-of-state children and parents. Uh, I chatted with Senator May Quaid, who said that it was not her intention that it would, but I've spoken to. Uh, two judges, one who spoke to another judge, a uh, county attorney and some commissioners, and they're fully convinced that it's not an inert section that only affects out-of-state people who cannot get uh, gender-affirming care. If you look at section three, which is um, pages uh, like um, on page 2.26 uh, to 3.4, it talks about a temporary emergency, just emergency jurisdiction. Um, uh, the court would have that, that jurisdiction if the person has, in current law, they've been abandoned, abused, or in this case, they've been unable to attain gender affirming care as defined in the section later on. And the judges believe that this is now elevated to the same level as those challenges. And that a county attorney could indeed find that a child had been denied gender affirming care and it could go into a court of emergency jurisdiction, which I don't believe is the intent of the author or the bill. And so uh, okay. now assuming this will bring some kids into child protection, this uh, legislation should be, should be sent to the health committee and maybe even back to judiciary to evaluate these, but the, the health committee for sure, because it hasn't been there, that's HHS. Um, and uh, because it's, uh, it's our jurisdiction. Uh, secondly, because um, what do you do with those and what could be transpiring? Uh, the second reason it should be sent to the health committee is there are some uh, adverse uh, effects of the health uh, impacts of gender affirming surgeries and, um, and medications and so on that go forward that have not been addressed at all. Uh, and who, when people, who is consenting to this and what might actually happen? There is a, a cadre of people across the world and I'm not burdening the committee with anything more than a summary of individuals who have had some of these various treatments uh, ranging from medication to surgery, and they had some remorse about that, and that would be interesting to know and to talk about as a side effect. Um, and that that's the, the, the heart of it. Um, and just to also relate on the grand scope of the bill, 
Uh, this section amends the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act, Chapter 518D, which is an interstate compact. And one of the judges remarked, I wonder what happens to the compact now if we're, um, you know, with this element, uh, as well as the others where we refuse to honor um, the jurisdictions. Uh, those jurisdictions are not my concern in this case. I'm talking about the impact on the health committee uh, relative to child protection and the health impacts. And so I'll let you react and then I have one, another comment after that. Thank you. Um, we have the author of the bill and then the health committee chair. So I'll go to um, Senator McQuaid. Do you have any comments after that? And then we'll go to Senator Wicklin and then I'll go to questions. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill does not uh, deal in any way with the kinds of health care that people are receiving. It just talks about um, what could happen if another state tries to reach into our state to either remove a child from their parents who allowed them access to health care. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any value placement on the health care that people receive. It doesn't require people to receive health care. It just doesn't allow another state to kidnap trans children from their parents for coming to this state to access care. Um, the bill has uh, an amendment was adopted in the Judiciary Committee, so it amends um, line 3.4 um, so that it says a child has been able, unable to obtain gender affirming health care um, in another state. So this bill actually has does not touch the Health and Human Services Committee. This bill is not um, opining or going into gender affirming care. It just says that um, children who receive gender affirming care in the state of Minnesota uh, can receive that care without threat of prosecution from other states if they travel here to, to access that care. So it's firmly within the Judiciary Committee. Um, the last thing I'll just say is that um, this has no uh, bearing or implication on child removal. Um, this just puts potential custody cases in the jurisdiction. The appropriate venue could be in the Minnesota court. So again, firmly within Judiciary, not within the Health and Human Services Committee. It's gone through its proper process and should be sent back to the floor. Um, Senator, thank you, Senator McQuaid. Senator Wickland, do you have any um, comments? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would support um, Senator McQuaid's comments. I do not believe that the, I, I believe the jurisdiction of the bill relates to um, areas within the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. And I do not believe that it does, especially now well, when Senator May quite uh, clarified the, the language that's been amended on line 3.3. Um, it doesn't change the way um, it, it affects judicial proceedings, not, um, not proceedings that would be in the jurisdiction of the Health and Human Services Committee. So I do not feel that it needs to be referred to my committee. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And actually, I am I was unaware of the in another state. I chatted with Senator May Quaid about this. And I, uh, if you would have told me that, then we wouldn't be here today. Uh, my, my desire was to either get rid of this section or make it clear this is for people not in the state because the section that, it, that it's amending talks about children in this state. Um, uh, specifically that. And so um, I am relieved and happy for that. And I'm sorry to take up the Rules Committee talk discussion about that. I just will remind members that this is not an inconsequential surgery or treatment. Uh, and that for the uh, testimony of the proponents of uh, this bill, uh, it is not without consequences to some individuals who have uh, some some later on in life, uh, some changes of their their view on if that was a good idea or not. So, but Madam Chair, just to, uh, my my main concern has been satisfied, and I'll just apologize that I need to for not knowing about that sentence. So, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Senator Abler, Senator Fronts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Makeway. Thank you, Senator Abler. Uh, I heard the word inconsequential. I just want to remind everybody that one of the things that's also not inconsequential is the suicide rate of these Americans that we are very concerned about. And so I appreciate very much the procedural argument, but we got human beings that we're talking about here. I want to thank you, Senator Makeway, for the work you're doing and appreciate the opportunity to address the bill as a whole. Thank you, Senator Dedzik. Thank you, Senator Lemmer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Abler, I want to thank you for your scrutiny on this bill. Uh, however, um, 
in listening to the discussion. I don't think we had a discussion about how it affects uh, interstate compact uh, contracts between other states. I don't think we had that discussion in the judiciary. Um, we uh, we did hear the bill. Um, I didn't even think of a background of an interstate contract uh, being even a focus of our judiciary committee hearing. Uh, but nevertheless, it'll be something I'll have to review during this break and uh, review it. Um, I don't think I've ever dealt with a violation of an interstate compact before uh, we pass uh, a number of them, uh, one or two every year. I think we have quite a few uh, in our in our compact agreements. So this will give me a little bit added uh, desire to scrutinize what what the heck happens when a state wants to violate or change a term on an interstate compact. So that'll be a new focus before we get to the floor. So thank you again. Oh, and by the way, uh, by the way, let the record show that uh, people do commit suicide when they're confused over this issue and cannot get what they consider is uh, of the affirmative care. But afterward, there's also a record of people committing suicide as well, uh, knowing that they had made a decision that's irreversible. And so um, uh, this just isn't a one-sided perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Makewade. So just looking at, at this particular bit of language too, uh, I know it wasn't fleshed out in judiciary, but uh, could you just talk a little bit about it in relation to the full faith and credit uh, clause in the U.S. Constitution and how this seems like there's, there's some overstep here in Minnesota. It might be ripe for a, a court case, but I'd be interested to hear uh, what you and the stakeholders have, have thought of on that. Senator McQuaid. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Johnson. So for full faith and credit, it's for full faith and credit to judgments. Um, and so we had a constitutional law scholar come and speak to the committee and say that they, there's no concerns um, in this bill about that. Um, it's a judgment that's issued in another state that could also be in violation of the constitution that we've experienced too. So the, the landscape that's emerging around, um, you know, people being allowed access to their own health care is changing every day. So uh, constitutional law scholars have, have said that they don't see a problem here. We are seeing uh, potential issues in other states um, with the laws that they are passing, trying to reach into our own. And so if, if there are full faith and credit uh, violations, it's more likely to be coming to us and not based on a law that we're passing in this state. So this is Senator something... Johnson. Um, Sorry, Madam Chair and Senator McQuaid. So this was something that was uh, looked at then in judiciary where you had an opportunity to, to talk about the implications. Okay. All right, members, um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. So um, I think Senator Limmer, I think is yours from earlier. Oh, I'm sorry, yep. I didn't remove it. Yep, I do that too. Um, so Senator Rust. Will you move that the committee report for Senate File 63 be adopted? Um, you are muted. I move that the uh, committee report for Senate File 63 um, be adopted. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. All right. And the um, committee report is adopted. Thank you. Okay, so the last set of bills that we're taking up, um, these are late bills. So we are not here to discuss the merits of the legislation, just to deal with the lateness of the bill. And I'm gonna um, juggle the order here because I think something, I, I need to switch to email to something is wrong on the first one. So I'm gonna go to, uh, Senate File 2307, this is Disaster Assistance Contingency Account, um, Senator Putnam. Is he here? 
So sorry, Madam Chair. Yes, I am. Yes. Senator Putnam. Uh, so Please let us um, know why the bill is late and why we why work should proceed on this bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Um, I, I do got to say how great it is to see you, Madam Chair, uh, if you don't thank mind you. me just throwing out there. Uh, this bill uh, was introduced on March 1st. A hearing was requested on March 3rd, uh, but uh, it didn't happen. Judiciary was backed up, uh, and it took a little while. Um, I also, you know, I sound like one of my students coming up with excuses. I'm doing this with full consciousness that I sound that way. But the other variable that slowed us down a little bit was... Um, uh, some imprecision and lack of communication with our friend in the lower body, uh, who was also carrying this bill. Um, uh, Representative Pulowski had his own sort of timeline and agenda for how things were supposed to proceed, and he and I did not communicate as efficiently as perhaps we should have. Um, the bill itself is non-controversial. We were heard in judiciary last week. Um, no questions, even. Uh, it's an important, very simple thing to do, which is another reason why we need to do it. Um, for those who aren't uh, aware of the, the content of the bill, it basically just fills back up the uh, disaster relief fund, uh, which is essential, uh, especially given the number of floods and, and uh, tornadoes and the stuff that happens. Uh, if we do not satisfy the refilling or replenishment of this account, uh, we need to have special session uh, whenever there's any kind of crisis like this. So it's a very basic, commonsensical, non-controversial uh, uh, bill that was just unfortunately slowed down um, by congestion in judici judiciary and um, uh, some communication struggles between myself and the lower body. All right, Senator Johnson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and you can add to the list bipartisan bill too, Senator Putnam. This is, uh, this is an important bill that I know that my district has used uh, the resources here and Senator Kupax as well uh, for spring flooding. And it's something that's uh, gonna be upon us pretty soon. So thank you for taking this bill forward, Senator Putnam. I think it's a pretty important, uh, it's, a, it's an important piece. Both uh, Senator Miller and myself have carried uh, this funding bill in the past and uh, I'm glad that it's, it's moving forward again. Uh, members, any other questions? Um, Senator Johnson, will you move that Joint Rule 2.03 be suspended for all further proceedings on Senate File 2307 and that 2307 do pass as amended and re referred to the Committee on Finance? So moved, Madam Chair. Okay, so Senator Johnson moves that Joint, file, joint Rule 2.03 be suspended for all further proceedings on Senate File 2307 and that Senate File 2307 do pass as amended and be re-referred to the Committee on Finance. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And the bill passes. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Yep. Um, and now we are going to uh, Senator Kupek. Um, this is on emergency incident preparedness. Senator Kupek, please let us know why this is a late bill and why work on this bill should proceed. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, this bill came out of really uh, after the train accident in uh, East Palestine, uh, Ohio. Uh, it was a bill that had been around previously and I think the work on developing the bill just took a little bit more time than we were expecting. And then it dropped uh, on the 29th of March, and it did get a hearing in transportation on the very last possible day that it could. Uh, and it still needs to go, though, to the Judiciary Committee for a couple of the things that are in the bill. Uh, why I think it should move forward was, well, at the day after the bill dropped, we had a train derailment in Minnesota. And so uh, the bill really works to address uh, making sure that communication between railroads, emergency managers, and making sure that we're prepared should there be an accident going forward. So it's a really, it's a bill more about communication and role playing out, you know, possible scenarios between railroads and emergency managers. Thank you, Senator Kupak. Members, any questions? All right, I'm not seeing any. So Senator Frentz, will you move that Joint Rule 2.03 be suspended for all further proceedings on Senate File 3187 and that Senate File 3187 do pass as amended and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary? I sure will, Madam Chair, so moved. 
Thank you. Senator Frentz moves that joint rule 2.03 be suspended for all further proceedings on Senate file 3187 and that Senate file 3187 do pass as amended and be re-referred to the committee on judiciary. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And with that, the bill is passed and we referred to Committee on Judiciary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank you. And now we're going to go to Senate File 49. And we got to wait a minute here because I have to. Look something up. All right, so well, this works. Um, Senate File 49 has a long title relating to health and healthcare. So Senator Wicklin, could you please, the, the title is Establishing Transitional Cost Sharing Reduction, Premium Subsidy, Small Employer Public Option, and Transitional Healthcare Credit, and it continues on after that. So Senator Wicklin, will you please let us know why this is a late bill and why work on this bill should proceed? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, Senate File 49 is our health care, uh, Minnesota care uh, public option bill. Uh, we had a hearing on it in February, and it is a very complex um, area, as you can imagine, um, having to do with um, setting forward some uh, new processes and new plans for health care access going forward. Uh, and in February, I indicated to my committee that um, while some of the ideas were not um, completely developed, that I would be bringing the bill back to my committee so that we could have additional discussion and uh, I could present uh, new, uh, new language. And so we did that um, last week, um, and it worked out to be um, beneficial to have a hearing last week because uh, the work on the omnibus had gotten to the point of being worked on by the Senate Council, and we had a, a hearing day that we could have uh, a discussion about this particular bill without interfering with the omnibus work. And so uh, we had the hearing, and now um, to get the bill uh, processed, we need to have it go to Commerce uh, for a hearing next week, and then off to Finance. Thank you, Senator Wickland. Uh, members, any questions? All right, not seeing any questions. Um, Senator Murphy, will you move that committee report for Senate File 49 be amended to refer the bill to the Committee on Commerce and that Joint Rule 2.03 be suspended for all further proceedings on Senate File 49 and that Senate File 49 as amended do pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Commerce? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. So Senate, Senator Murphy moves that the committee report for Senate File 49 be amended to refer the bill to the Committee on Commerce and that Joint Rule 2.03 be suspended for all further proceedings on Senate File 49 and that Senate File 49 as amended do pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Commerce. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. And thank you. And the bill um, passes and is re-referred to the Committee on Commerce. So thank you. Thank so you, Madam Chair. Uh, and of course, where did my stuff go here? All right, I think that is it for um, our business of the day. So thank you members for um, sticking around. It, again, it's good to see all of you. Um, have a, enjoy your break, um, enjoy some time off and um, happy Passover, happy Easter for those that celebrate. And with that members, the meeting is adjourned.